So today we're going to look at double integrals over general regions in section 15.2. And our goals are going to be to describe type 1, type 2, and type 3 regions, to describe piecewise regions. We're also going to compute double integrals over type 1, type 2, type 3, and piecewise regions. And we're going to find regions of integration and compute double integrals. So to start off with, we're going to do some theory about what we're talking about, and then we'll conclude with a bunch of examples. So to begin, recall last time we talked about uh, multivariable integration, where we had a rectangular base. In this case, the base has the bounds from A to B in the x direction and from C to D in the y direction. And we use our double integral to compute the volume of this solid that has a height given by some function f of x, y. And this is great. It works well. But this is an example where the region of integration is this rectangular region. And for this section, we're going to talk about uh, taking integrals when our base is no longer just a boring rectangular region. So let's say that we want to have a region in the xy plane and the base of the solid down here, the region d, is this crazy circle looking thing. We're doing the exact same thing when integrating, we're thinking of this base uh, as the region in the xy plane, and the height is given by this function f of xy. So let's start with an example, our motivating example. Let's say we want to find the volume of a solid with a base bounded by y equals x and y equals x squared, and a height given by f of xy equals x squared y plus 4x. So let's start by taking a look at this base. This base is the region of integration. Maybe I'll write that down. The base is the region of integration. And it's always going to be down in the xy plane. Well, in these examples, it's always in a, a, a fixed plane. And we usually think of the xy plane as the bottom. So let's draw a picture of this. Notice that our bounds are y equals x, that's just this straight line, so I'll draw this straight line. And then we're also bounded by the curve y equals x squared, that's our most basic parabola. I chose boring functions for our beginning example. Shoop, that's my parabola. <laughs> it's a bad looking parabola. I'll label it y equals x squared, y equals x. And I guess my first question is, how would you so this is our base of integration. It's this region that's bounded by these two curves, and I'll label my region D for the domain. That's sort of standard notation. Um, how would you describe this? If you were talking with your friend, and I say, I want to have my points that are in here, the easiest way to talk about this is the fact that, oh, how do the heights change? I can think of breaking this up into a lot of little vertical line segments. And for each vertical line segments, what are the bounds on the y values? Because these vertical lines are talking about my y values. My y values are going from where y equals x to y equals x squared. And the notation that I'm going to use for that is that they're bounded from below by the curve x. And my y values are bounded above by the curve x squared. But this only tells me the bounds in height. You could think of like places out here could be bounded between x squared and x, but we want to have them start at the point x equals 0 and end at the intersection point. And in this case, the intersection point is where my x values are equal to 1. So that means that my x values are going from 0 to 1. So when I think about my bounds on the x values, the x's go from 0 to 1. That's easy enough, right? This is one way to think about describing this region. This is by breaking it up into vertical line segments, and that's what we call a type 1 region. Type 1 region, I break into vertical line segments. And we'll formalize this in just a second. So what if I wanted to break it up into horizontal line segments? This is maybe a little artificial because for this example, there's no reason why we might want to, but let's say that we did. Um, we'll see other regions where it makes more sense to break it up horizontally. So what if I wanted to think about the bounds? 
when I think about breaking it up with horizontal line segments, I'm asking myself, how are my x's bounded? My x values in this case are bounded on the left by this curve and on the right by this curve. So one way to say that, if my x's are bounded on the left, bounded on the left by the line, and we have to write the line in terms of x equals something. And in this case, it's the line x equals y. Right, I just solved for x, I just flipped the order. And what are they bounded on the right by? They're bounded on the right by the parabola. And again, the parabola here, it's written as the parabola y equals x squared, right? But we want to be able to write it in terms of x. And so I'm going to have to do a little math. x squared equals y. That means x is equal to plus or minus the square root of y. And I know that I want the positive y values because this part of the curve, all of my y values are positive. So that means it's bounded on the right by the curve x equals square root of y. So now I have set up the bounds for my x. I know that my x values are bounded on the left by the straight line y, and they're bounded on the right by the parabola x equals square root of y. So these are the bounds on x, and then we have to know what range of values my y's are trapped between. And in this case, my y's go from a y value of 0 up to a y value of 1. So I know that my y values go from 0 to 1. And this describes my, my region. Let's look at a little bit of formal. Whoops. Oh, no, that's off the screen. Here, my y values go between 0 and 1. Let's look at some formal notation for describing regions, now that we've talked about these two types of regions. So a type 1 region is where we break it up into vertical line segments, like this. And the reason why it's a type 1 region is because the vertical line segments have a function along the bottom and a function along the top. And that's given written right here. This is saying that my y values, these vertical line segments, are trapped between this lower curvy function, f1, and this upper curvy function, f2 whereas my x values go from a constant a to a constant b. And it's important, the reason why this is type 1 is because the x values are trapped between constants. On the other hand, a type 2 region, and this is all of my formal notation saying that it's the set of ordered pairs x, y, where my y coordinates are the ones that are trapped between constants. So for a type 2 region, I'm thinking of breaking it up into these horizontal segments. And my y values go from a fixed constant a to b, whereas my x values are the ones that get trapped between these crazy curves, with the left curve on the left, and I call that f sub 1, and the y the, this other crazy curve on the right, I call it f2. And notice that x has to be a function of y, which is not typically the way that we write functions. Those are our names for type 1 and type 2 regions. Finally, I in the introduction, I said that there was going to be a type 3 region. Type 3 regions are regions that can be written as both type 1 and type 2. So the example that we just saw was a type 3 region because we could write it either way. Um, rectangles are also both type 1 and type 2 regions because I th can think about breaking it up vertically and my x's are constants, or I can think about breaking it up horizontally and my y values provide constants. So let's go ahead and finish our example. Remember that uh, the whole reason why we're talking about these regions is so that we're able to um, do integration over them. So let's set up what we did before. We said that we can describe the base in one of two ways. We can describe it as a type 1 base. Whoops, type 1. And when we describe it as a type 1, that's where our y values were trapped between x and x squared with x squared on the bottom. Let's get our picture out. Here we go. 
right? X squared was at the bottom, and X is on top. And our X values were trapped between 0 and 1. And we're going to convert this into an integration. It means that our integral, our X values are going from 0 to 1. And our Y values are going from X squared up to X. I'm going to pause for a second. It's important that I write the integration in this order. The constants always have to be on the outside. Otherwise, when I do the integration, and maybe I'll have you do this on your own, if I were to flip these, I would end up with a bunch of x's in my output. And I don't want a bunch of x's. I want a constant. So I'm going to write that down, that constant bounds must be on the outside. And what are we integrating? We're integrating over the height function. And in this case, the height is given by x squared y plus 4x. And our variables, we're going to integrate with respect to y first because it's on the inner bound. And then we're going to integrate with respect to x second because it's on the outer bound. So let's go ahead and do this integration. When I integrate with respect to y, I'm treating x as a constant. And I can integrate this to find that I get the integral of y is 1 half y squared, so I get 1 half x squared y squared plus 4x I'm treating as a constant, and so the integra integral of a constant, I'm going to add my y onto it. It's evaluated from y equals x squared to x, and don't forget that I have this outer integral still hiding outside that I haven't evaluated yet. So now I plug in the bounds of y. When I have y equals x, what do I get here? This first chunk becomes 1 half x squared times x squared, which becomes x to the fourth, plus 4x times x is x squared, minus plugging in x squared and then squaring it becomes x to the fourth x to the fourth times two more x's gives me a total of six x's multiplied together, so I get one half x to the sixth plus four times x times x times x is four x cubed. And we need to integrate this. I notice I don't actually have any terms that I can even combine, so I'm not going to worry about combining terms. And when I integrate this, I bump up my power on x, and I get x to the fifth times one-fifth, so this becomes a one-tenth out front, plus bumping this up to the third, I get four-thirds x to the third, minus one-fourteenth x to the seventh, minus, distributing this minus sign, uh, this x cubed becomes x to the fourth, and so it cancels out with the 4, and I get x to the 4th. And that's evaluated from x equals 0 to 1. And finally, when I plug in these values, when I plug in 1, I get 1 tenth plus 4 thirds minus 1 14th minus 1. And then I have to subtract out plugging in 0, but that's just going to be 0. And I can leave my answer there. I could get a common denominator here to figure out what this actually is, but I don't actually want to. I'll let you do that on your own because I don't feel like it. But what did we do? This was an example where we thought of this as a type 1 region. And I'm really quickly going to show you what happens if our constant bounds are not on the outside. If our constant bounds aren't on the outside, we're going to rework this problem, only this time I'm going to set it up with my y's on the outside where there are these functions of x's, and we'll see what goes wrong. So this is not good. If you're taking notes and you're, that this is not the way that we want to do it, but I want to do it for illustration right now. Um, we're going from x, x squared y plus 4x is our function. X's are on the inside, so it's dx dy, so I'm integrating with respect to x first. 
When I integrate this with respect to x, I get 1 third x cubed y plus 2x squared evaluated from x equals 0 to 1. And don't forget that we have an integral on the outside. So when I plug in 1 for x, I end up with 1 third y plus 2. When I plug 0 in for x, all of these go to 0. So now I'm just integrating as y equals x squared to x dy. What happens when I integrate with respect to y? I get 1 sixth y squared plus 2y. And I have to evaluate that from y equals x squared to x. And when I plug in my, oh no, that was all off the page. I apologize. So. Um, I did my integral I, with respect to y. Now I need to plug in my x's where my y's are. I get 1 sixth x squared plus 2x minus, plugging in x squared, I get 1 sixth x to the fourth plus 2x squared. And I'm done. But notice, what was I trying to compute? I was trying to compute the volume of this. And I end up with this expression that has a bunch of x's in it. And so this is something that's actually meaningless. Well, I mean, there's meaning, but it's um, not a volume. When you do these definite integrals, you want to be able to come up with something. We want variable free stuff. So it didn't work when we did it that way. How could we? So let's talk about interchanging the order of integration. And this is the final thing that we'll talk about before we go to the next topic. So let's say that I wanted to do this example, but I wanted to interchange the order of integration. So when I interchange the order of integration, instead of I, it means I want to have my y's on the outside and my x's on the inside. I can't, I can't just move it to the outside. I'm going to have to use the fact that it could be a type 2 region. And remember, when we had it as a type 2 region, that meant that our y values went from 0 to 1. And we were using the picture to be able to figure out, I'll recall, so when we're thinking of it horizontally, and our x values went from y to square root y. So our x values go from y to square root of y. So now I can interchange the order of integration because my y's are bounded by constants. My y's are going from 0 to 1, and my x's are going from y to square root y. And then I have this function plus 4x d x dy and i could follow through and do the integration in this order and we would get the same answer as we did when we were thinking of it as a type 1 region i'm not going to do all of that work right now but that's something that you can do